This is Howie Hawkins. I'm a green candidate for the nomination for president. I have the nomination of the Socialist Party. And last night I made a brief statement about uh, now is the time for the people that supported Bernie Sanders uh, to look at our campaign because we're fighting for a number of the things that Bernie Sanders was fighting for. Medicare for all, Green New Deal, Economic Bill of Rights. And this is a way to keep the fight for those things going on right through November and beyond, because it's clear that Joe Biden and the Democratic Party are not going to support those things. So, you know, the feedback I got is people want to hear more. So uh, what I think I'll do tonight, maybe 15, 20 minutes, is talk about, uh, you know, some of the key issues that I'm campaigning on and uh, then a little bit about why the Green Party, instead of uh, settling for Joe Biden against Trump, and uh, then we got hundreds of questions. We asked for questions and we'll take what we can, but uh, try to wrap it up in about 30 minutes. So uh, let's get started. You know, some people are asking, well, who is Howie Hawkins? Well, I'm a recently retired Teamster. I worked construction before that, I, but uh, that was to pay the rent. You know, really, I've been involved in movements for peace, justice, civil rights, labor, the environment since the 1960s. I came up in the San Francisco Bay Area, now living in Syracuse, New York. Um, and through that whole period, I've been committed to building an independent working class party committed to participatory democracy, democratic socialism, and ecology. And I've been involved in the Green Party since our first national meeting in 1984. Uh, ran a lot of campaigns. The Green Party in New York ran me three times for governor. Each time we got enough votes to get a ballot line for the Green Party. And in 2014, we got 5% of the vote in a year when Andrew Cuomo was trying to run up the vote, get more than his father, Mario Cuomo, ever got, get more than he got when he first got elected in 2010. And he got less because I got 5%. And Cuomo realized he couldn't take the progressive vote for granted. He had to move our way on some issues. So we got a ban on fracking, a $15 minimum wage, and paid family leave. So I know one of the questions, you know, people ask is, well, how are you going to win? We don't necessarily have to win the office to have leverage in the political system. Of course, we do want to win, but uh, it's better to vote for what you want and maybe not got your candidate elected, but then everybody knows what we stand for. You know, you vote for the Green Party, it's clear what it stands for. If you settle for Biden and you're a Sanders socialist, <clears throat> nobody knows that. It gets lost in the sauce. <coughs> and so we don't really know the support we have for these issues like Medicare for all. So, you know, I'm running because a lot of Greens asked me to run around the country. And so what we agreed to do uh, was really try to, you know, emphasize building the Green Party from the bottom up. That means uh, electing thousands of Greens to local office as we go into the 2020s and from there to state office and Congress. And when we have a caucus in Congress, our presidential ticket, they won't be able to ignore it. <clears throat> the Greens have about 160 people elected around the country. And that's more than any party on the left since the heyday of the Socialist Party uh, from the 1930s back to about 1900. So that's something, but there's 500,000 elected officers in this country. We can, it's just a drop in the bucket what we got now. And we're running out of time. The two major parties are not solving, you know, the life or death issues we face or even basic problems. Like now we got this coronavirus crisis and we can't get organized to produce and distribute the medical supplies that people need. So I'm campaigning, uh, leading with three key issues that are life or death it's the climate. It's inequality, because inequality kills, because we've had stagnant wages since the 1970s and the cost of living for housing and health care and college has gone up. Uh, life expectancies in the working class have been going down. And uh, we now have a 20 year life expectancy gap between our richest and poorest counties. And so that's a life or death issue. And then the third issue is this new nuclear arms race which as you probably know, the bulletin of the atomic scientists just moved their doomsday clock the closest to midnight that it's ever been. And I'm the only presidential candidate talking about it. And it's a huge issue 
They're not trying to make a top campaign issue. So let me go through each of those issues and talk about you know, what I propose to do about it. With regard to the climate, I'm calling for an eco-socialist Green New Deal. I first campaigned for a Green New Deal in 2010 when I ran for governor against Andrew Cuomo. And I was the first candidate in this country to call for a Green New Deal. And then it was coming out of the Great Recession. So it was as much a economic recovery program as a climate action program. And that's the situation we're in right now, because as we come out of this coronavirus depression, uh, we're going to have to put a lot of public investment into getting the economy going. Besides that, we've got to replace uh, a lot of the technology and manufacturing that we have because it's heating up the planet and polluting the environment. So I say an eco-socialist Green New Deal, a lot of this has to be done through the public sector on a time scale we need. The uh, plan that I have, and there's a budget on my website, you can you know look at all the details. Um, the goal is to get to zero to negative greenhouse gas emissions and 100 percent clean energy in all sectors by 2030. And that's because that's what the carbon budgets that the climate scientists have produced say rich countries like the United States got to do. And that can't be done by just putting out, you know, some tax incentives and subsidies and a few regulations here and mandates there. The industries will fight that and it will get all gummed up. What we got to do is do what we did during World War II. In that emergency, the federal government took over or built a quarter of the manufacturing capacity of the country. And that was in order to turn industry on a dime into what they called the arsenal of democracy. And that armed the US, the UK, Russia, in order to defeat the Nazis. And we gotta do the same kind of thing to defeat climate change. So my Eco-Socialist Green New Deal uh, calls for reorganizing uh, energy production through the public sector. So that means uh, a public power generation and, and uh, utility grid system. It also means taking over the big oil and gas companies so that while we use those fossil fuels in the transition, the earnings go to reinvestment in renewables. If we leave it in the hands of Chevron and Exxon and the Koch brothers, they are just gonna reinvest that in more oil and gas drilling. So we gotta take them over. So we have a public sector for energy. And then we have a public sector for transportation. I mean, our rail system in this country is third world. Um, we need to uh, electrify all the rail systems. We need to densify the freight rails so we can take a lot of the freight off the roads and put it on rails, which is more energy efficient and cleaner. <coughs> and we've got to uh, build high speed bullet trains to reduce the need for short and intermediate range air travel. And we got to rebuild the trolley systems that this country had between the 1890s and the 1930s, light rails in the cities. And that's not going to be done unless we have a national rail corporation that plans that out. And I think now would be a good time if we were doing it to bring the airlines into that. They're four big airlines. Their stocks are way down. They'd be cheap to get right now. And we need to coordinate our air networks with our rail network as we move to more rail transportation for those short and intermediate distances. So that's another sector we wanna bring into the public sector. And then finally, manufacturing. We need to do what we did during World War II. We've gotta replace productive systems that are polluting and heating up the planet. For example, steel production. Instead of coke ovens, we gotta to go to electric arc furnaces. But the steel industry, which is moving that way as the coke ovens wear out, they're not moving fast enough. They want to use those coke ovens till they're all worn out. So we've got to take them over and uh, move in that direction quickly. Uh, cement production, that's 5% of the world's greenhouse uh, or yeah, greenhouse gas footprint because they put calcium carbonate in the cement. The calcium is to harden it, but the carbon, when they heat it, goes up into the atmosphere. And that's why it's such a big contributor to global warming. Plastics, you know, we have a huge plastics problem and we produce plastics with petrochemicals that are synthetic plastics that are not biodegradable. We've got to have a green chemistry in the, in the plastics industry that produces biodegradable plastics with agricultural feedstocks. So those are just three of the technologies we've got to transform. Of course, energy production, largely solar and wind. We 
phase out gas and oil and coal. And we want to do that all on a 10 year time scale. So that's why we call it an eco socialist Green New Deal, because we got to do this through the public sector. And in some cases, like the uh, manufacturing, we can create those factories and then lease them to worker cooperatives. So workers can manage their own work and keep the full fruit of their labor instead of like under capitalism where they get a fixed wage and every surplus value they create is taken by the owners. So it'll be a better deal for workers. So those are uh, some of the elements of the Eco-Socialist Green New Deal. It covers not just power production, which is 28% of our carbon footprint, but also transportation, which is 29%, manufacturing, agriculture, and buildings, which is the other you know, 40%. And most of the Green New Deal programs out there only deal with energy production. Bernie Sanders did have the only serious one among the Democrats. And he did uh, have a goal of getting to 100% uh, clean energy and zero emissions in the energy and transportation sectors, which is good. But he added another 20 years to take buildings, transportation, and uh, I'm sorry, buildings, manufacturing, and agriculture. And we don't think that's a fast enough timetable. So Bernie's 10-year program was 16.3 trillion. Our program is 27 and a half trillion uh, over 10 years because we're on a faster timetable. So basically, we're going in the same direction as Bernie. We're just getting there faster. So that's the climate action program, the Eco Socialist Green New Deal. Now we've always, and this goes right back to the first time I raised this in 2010, included an economic bill of rights as part of our Green New Deal. And that's the piece that deals with inequality, which has been growing, as I mentioned. It's leading to declining life expectancies in the working class in this country. And so what we want to do is guarantee six basic economic rights. And these are similar to Bernie's 21st century economic bill of rights, except we have one that he does not. And that is a, a guaranteed minimum income above poverty which was a demand of the Economic Bill of Rights that Martin Luther King and the Poor People's Campaign put forward in 1968. And I think that's crucial to ending poverty and economic despair. So, you know, that's one right, an income guarantee. And instead of a universal basic income, like Andrew Yang was talking about, where you give everybody the same amount of money, whether it's Donald Trump or the poorest person in the country, this would be done through the tax system. So if your income is below the poverty line, the government sends you checks to get you above the poverty line. And if you're above the poverty line, then you pay taxes on a progressively scaled basis. But that is a cheaper way to uh, make sure people that need money get it and we end poverty. And it's an efficient way and it's adapted. So as if your situation improves and you're making more than the poverty line, then you don't get the, uh, the income. But if you fall below it, you do. So you're not uh, living in poverty. That's the income guarantee. We want a job guarantee. And this would be basically uh, making what we did during the Great Depression with the uh, Works Progress Administration uh, universal so that every person in America, <clears throat> excuse me, willing and able to work who can't find a job in the private sector can get a public job doing public services or working on public works, infrastructure. And it would be like we did during uh, the Works Progress Administration. Those uh, projects, for the most part, were planned locally. And the local governments would chip in 10%. So there was buy-in and, and it avoided boondoggles. And the federal government provided 90% of the funding. And so if you're unemployed, instead of going to the unemployment office, you would go to the employment office and say, I want my job. And the community would have decided you know, what services and what public works needed work, and they'd put you to work. And we'd have a training component, so uh, if you needed your skills uh, raised to be able to do the work that's needed, uh, that would be provided. So that's the job guarantee, that's the second one. The third one is affordable housing for all. And what I'm calling for is, first of all, universal rent control just to stop the uh, displacement of people, the evictions of people, because the rent is too damn high, too much around across the country. And that's why homelessness now is at least half a million people. So we did that during World War II. We had federal rent control because 
all the productive effort was going into producing arms and the war effort and housing wasn't being produced and landlords landlords started gouging. So the federal government set up a rent control program. And I think we need to do that now in the housing emergency we have. But then in, in the longer run, and this is a 10 year program, it's in the Eco Socialist Green New Deal. It's uh, 2.5 trillion over 10 years to produce 25 million units of public housing. And that would make public housing about 20% of the uh, housing stock in the country instead of less than 1%, which it is today. And it would be public housing done the right way. What we've done since World War II, uh, well, up until the 1970s when we, we pretty much stopped building public housing, was we took poor people, mostly people of color, and segregated them in these projects in the worst parts of town. The kind of public housing we're talking about is quality developments everywhere in metropolitan areas, inner city, inner ring suburb, outer ring suburb, quality developments that would be an enhancement to any community. And they'd be mixed income, like they are in Europe, where you have professionals and regular working class folks and poor people living in the same developments. And we need that to reduce segregation, which has been growing steadily uh, really since the Fair Housing Law pa or Act passed in 1968. So we have more uh, economic and race segregation than we did before. So this housing program is a desegregation program as well as a housing program. Obviously it's a jobs program. It's also a clean energy program because we will build these uh, to be powered by clean energy heated and cooled with clean energy. And uh, you can use building materials that sequester carbon. So that's the housing for all program, affordable housing for all. And then we wanna make sure everybody has health coverage, comprehensive health coverage. And that's where we're talking about Medicare for all. And what I'm talking about is immediately implementing national health insurance, which is the kind of program we're getting from the Democrats and in and, and the uh, House and Senate including Bernie Sanders. And national health insurance means the public single payer pays for medical services, but the delivery is a mix of public and private. And the problem with that is the private uh, providers, as well as the drug companies, uh, are out to maximize their income. And then that raises the cost on national health insurance. It also leads to a, a unjust and irrational distribution of healthcare resources. So what we want to do after we get national health insurance implemented immediately is over the next 10 years, build out a national health service where the hospitals and clinics are publicly owned, the doctors, the nurses, the healthcare providers and, and workers are uh, public servants, paid salaries, rather than on a fee-for-service basis where they have incentive to maximize their income, do extra tests, you know, give you things you don't really need um, because a lot of them now are now working in corporate structures where they're pressured to do that. <clears throat> and it would be democratically controlled by a federation of locally elected health boards, one third by the general public, I mean, sorry, two thirds by the general public and one third by the healthcare providers. Now this is a system that, uh, you know, back in the 1970s, we had three options. One was the Nixon plan, which is what we basically got now with the Affordable Care Act, you know, mandates on employers and individuals to buy private insurance with some government subsidies. Um, and then there was the Kennedy plan, which is national health insurance. And then there was the Ron Dellums plan for, a, he called it uh, on the bill, the Josephine Butler United States Health Service. And that's the system I just described. And that bill he carried until Barbara Lee took his place and she dropped it in 2013 after Obamacare passed, which I think is a shame and we need to bring it back because uh, I think it's a better system in terms of democratic accountability and cost control and making sure with the local health boards, they can make sure every neighborhood's got clinics and that we're not buying too, too many MRIs and neglecting uh, basic health services. Because, you know, what we got now is hospitals compete for customers. So to advertise their MRIs, we got more MRIs than we need and not enough uh, primary health care. So that's uh, Medicare for all leading to a national health service. And then we want to have uh, lifelong tuition-free public education from childcare and pre-K through post-secondary education. And that includes colleges and universities, technical schools, and continuing adult education. And this is something that 
many countries in the world provide. Uh, New York City, for example, had the City University of New, of New York was tuition free from 1848 until 1976. And after the fiscal crisis there, they started charging tuition. And we're a much richer country now. So that just seems to me inexcusable. And finally, we need to make sure everybody can have a secure retirement. And there are pension reforms I could talk about. And actually, Bernie had good answers to that. I'm somebody, the victim of a bill passed in the middle of the night by both parties, omnibus spending bill in 2014, called the Multi-Employer Pension Reform Act, which removed our protections under the Employment Retirement Income Security Act of 1974, which said our earned benefits could not be cut. So instead of helping uh, pension funds in trouble, uh, Bernie's plan basically closed some tax loopholes for the rich and put the money into the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation to help these uh, pension plans in trouble. Instead, they said the pension plans could cut our benefits. So as I was about to retire, uh, I had a work extra year, I would have been cut 30%. I got cut 20%. So we need pension reform, but to deal with the problem immediately, we should double Social Security benefits. That will help, particularly now the uh, the boomer generation, you know, they raised their kids, their wages were stagnant, the cost of living went up, and they don't have savings. And there's been a plan out since 2010. Stephen Hill wrote it up in The Atlantic and in a book to double Social Security benefits, how it could be paid for. And I think that's the quickest way to secure uh, our retirement for everybody of retirement age. So that's the economic bill of rights. So we've dealt with the climate crisis, inequality. And then we have this new nuclear arms race. We, we're really in an insane situation because uh, the United States started modernizing its nuclear forces. That means strategic nukes that are six times faster, hypersonic. And the other countries like Russia are following suit. That means instead of 20 minutes to figure out if you got a false warning, you haven't, you're going on a hunch that the other might strike first, so you better strike first. And then at the uh, tactical nuke level, we're putting more tactical nukes in the conventional forces with the crackpot idea called escalate to de-escalate. So if you get a conventional threat, you escalate with tactical nukes to stop it, and then you're going to de-escalate. And I think that's, that's crazy because as soon as the tactical nukes start flying, the strategic nukes are going to start flying. And we've got out of all the nuclear treaties except the one remaining is the New START Treaty, the Strategic Arms Treaty, the last bilateral treaty between the United States and Russia. It expires next February 5th, and there's no negotiations going on between the United States and Russia. So as I said, that's why the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has moved their clock closer to midnight than ever. And those tactical nukes, you know, when we just had that recent crisis <clears throat> in Iran, our warships were outfitted with a new tactical nuke. You know, imagine if Trump had got up grumpy one of those days. You know, we might already had that damn nuclear war. So this is an existential threat. So what I'm calling for are nuclear disarmament initiatives by the United States to reduce tensions. We should pledge no first use of nuclear weapons. We should unilaterally disarm to a minimum credible deterrent. And then on the basis of those tension reducing initiatives, go to the other eight nuclear powers and say, we want to negotiate complete mutual nuclear disarmament. And we can enlist the world in that effort, world public opinion, because two years ago, there was a treaty, uh, the text to which was agreed to by 120 new nations. None of them were nuclear, but the rest of the world scared. And that's the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And the international campaign for the abolition of nuclear weapons got the Nobel Peace Prize for that achievement. And hardly anybody in this country knows about it because our corporate media hasn't talked about it and none of the other presidential candidates are talking about it. So I think that is a crucial issue. I'm trying to make it a top campaign issue. And uh, we're just gonna try to force that into the debate. And that's part of a whole program of uh, reorienting US foreign and military policy away from being the world's global military empire and trying to change governments by military force and occupying countries and having over 800 foreign military bases and bringing the troops home, getting out of these endless wars and orient our defense to a home-based defense of our own territory. And instead of 
uh, alienating the world. And the public opinion polls around the world say they fear the United States as a, a threat to peace more than any other country. Uh, we should be the world's humanitarian superpower. We should take this Green New Deal and take it global and make friends instead of enemies and use diplomacy and international law to promote peace and democracy and human rights instead of force of arms, which doesn't end up promoting peace, democracy, and human rights. So uh, that's the foreign policy. So those are some of the key issues. And, uh, you know, we get a good response from them. But then uh, people say, but Trump, man, Trump is president. He's a monster. We got to get him out of there. And uh, you're the spoiler. And, you know, my answer to that is the Democrats have spoiled this election in that regard. Because ever since, you know, Ralph Nader ran as the Green Party candidate in 2000, the Democrats have been whining about the Green uh, about the Green Party because the Electoral College gave the presidency to the person who was the loser. Bush was the loser and Trump was the loser of the popular vote. Instead of joining with the Greens for the solution, which is to abolish the Electoral College and go to a ranked choice national popular vote for president, they want to complain about the Greens. And if the Greens are not in this election, that solution won't be raised. So we're in this election to raise real solutions to these problems that won't otherwise be raised and to advance those solutions in the political process. And then people will say, well, uh, that requires a constitutional amendment to get rid of the Electoral College. Yeah, it does. So what? I mean, are you just going to say, oh, it's hard and we're going to whine about it but not do anything about it? I mean, I would remind people that the last amendment that passed, the 27th Amendment, which uh, barred Congress from giving itself a raise until there was another congressional election. That was sitting around as part of the original 12 amendments and the original Bill of Rights that Madison put out for over 200 years. And then in the 80s, it swept through the states and got adopted. It was an idea whose time has come. And I would argue that ranked choice voting is an idea whose time has come. We have it in more than 20 cities and some counties. And now the state of Maine has adopted it for their elections, including how they will allocate their electoral votes in this presidential election. This is an idea whose time has come, and it's one of those ideas this campaign can advance and you know make the country and the major party candidates and the media deal with. So I said 20 minutes. I think I've been going almost 30. So uh, we did say we would take some questions. So uh, I see some questions in my uh, feed here, and you know I apologize. I know hundreds of questions were submitted, and we're going to have more of these question and answer sessions going forward. But let's take a few uh, right now. Um, so it says, "Wouldn't voting for Biden mean a more liberal Supreme Court of the United States?" Uh, yeah, slightly more liberal, but it'll still be very pro corporate. I mean, if you look, there was a study done by Fordham University at the Clinton appointees compared to the Reagan appointees. And on economic class issues, uh, the Clinton appointees were worse than the Reagan appointees. And they weren't so great on things like women's rights. They modified Roe v. Wade and weakened it uh, during the Clinton years. So you can't make one issue a litmus test when there are all these other issues. And as I said, we got life or death issues we got to deal with, and we're running out of time. The climate crisis isn't waiting. The nuclear arms are on hair trigger alert. And for everyday people that are working class, you know, the economic despair is a life or death issue. Are you going to pay for your rent or are you going to pay that utility bill? The man that lives downstairs from where I'm sitting right near right now died last year because at the end of March he said, decided He's going to pay his utility bills and his rent instead of getting the kidney medicine. He was on Medicaid uh, that he was told he needed and he had been using, but he skipped it that month to pay his bills. And his kidneys failed about two weeks later and he died. That's the kind of thing that keeps happening over and over and over again. So these are life or death issues. So the Supreme Court is important. I agree. And I would also say I think Bernie Sanders had an interesting idea. And that is, uh, it may be legal to have the president uh, rotate people uh, off the Supreme Court on the circuit courts and rotate them around the courts. Um, 
I'm no lawyer. I know it's a controversial proposal, but uh, I think it's worth exploring as a way of mitigating the damage that the court we already got is going to give because these people are lifetime appointments. So I, that's my answer to that question about the uh, Supreme Court. So the second question here is, uh, what is your position on cannabis and other drugs? Well, I think cannabis, marijuana should be uh, legalized, taxed, and regulated. Uh, it's less harmful than tobacco and alcohol, and uh, it just should not be part of the criminal justice system. Uh, the other illicit drugs I would decriminalize uh, for people who are possessing them. Um, that should be a health problem that we address, not a criminal problem. And I like the program they have in Portugal, where if you're possessing an illicit drug, uh, you, you aren't put in the criminal justice system. You're given a violation in a, and you show up at a hearing with a lawyer, a social worker, and a doctor. And they look at your situation and they see how they can help. Do you need drug treatment? Uh, do you need to talk to somebody, you know, social worker, therapist? Um, do you need a job? Um, and, and so they help people. And what has uh, been the result, and this was instituted in 2001, is that there are hardly any drug overdoses. People don't die that way. Uh, violence related to the drug trade has completely disappeared. There are actually less people using those illicit drugs, and there are more people who are on drugs seeking treatment. So that's a harm reduction approach that I think will help us reduce the mass incarceration that we've had of uh, nonviolent drug offenders, who I think should be released from prison uh, with the support they need to integrate back into society without getting uh, addicted or dependent on drugs. and uh, you know, expunge their records and let them reintegrate into society and reduce this prison population, which in our country is bigger than any other country in the world. And, you know, we have legitimate criticisms of the authoritarianism of other countries, but we're not very credible when we imprison more people than any other country on earth. So the qu third question is, what is your position on BDS, that's Boycott Divestment Sanctions, in the Israel-Palestinian situation. Well, I do support boycott divestment sanctions, BDS. I support it because it's been called by the Palestinian uh, movement. Omar Barghouti uh, was the first to call for it. There's a Palestinian National BDS Committee, and it has broad support in Palestinian society. I see it as analogous to the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, and I was very involved in this country in uh, fighting to get divestment and eventually U.S. sanctions against South Africa, which I think were successful in forcing the apartheid regime to decide they had a choice between keeping apartheid or doing business with the rest of the world. And they decided uh, they, they had to do business with the rest of the world. And so they opened up and they now have a democratic society. Not that it doesn't have its problems, but it, it's no longer official apartheid. And I think uh, the, the analogy applies to uh, the Israel-Palestine situation. <clears throat> and I would say that there are a lot of sanctions the United States imposed on other countries. And particularly now in this coronavirus situation, we should just lift those sanctions. Iran, uh, Venezuela, North Korea, they need medical supplies, they need aid and trade to get them there. And, uh, you know, economic sanctions are really an act of war under international law. And they should be... Uh, judiciously applied, and I think we use them too much. But in the case of uh, Palestine and Israel, I think they're justified because Israel is uh, grossly violating the human rights and civil rights of Palestinians, both within Israel and in the occupied territories. So I think the United States needs to do that. We can, If we want to play a constructive role, we just can't uh, give Israel a free hand to keep occupying and expanding uh, the settlements in the territories. And what the BDS National Committee in Palestine now says is the first thing we should do is uh, cut military aid. That would be the top priority. And I think we should start uh, putting those sanctions on Israel, starting with military aid, and escalate them until they respond uh, to recognizing the human rights of the Palestinians. And uh, I don't think that solution will be solved by us. It's got to be solved by the people living in Israel and Palestine. 
So we got to promote negotiations and we can't be a neutral broker as long as we're doing whatever Israel wants and uh, not uh, being even handed. So that's the way I look at the, that, those questions. Uh, next question, do you support an investigation into the Tara Reid allegation? And that's an allegation of uh, sexual assault against Joe Biden. And I think any allegation should be investigated. And, you know, the Me Too movement said, you know, start listening to the women. And we should with due process, but I don't think that should be brushed aside. And it's interesting to me how uh, much less serious allegations against Al Franken you know, pushed them out of the Senate in a minute. And these don't seem to be being discussed, uh, certainly by the Democrats who pushed Al Franken out, out or by the uh, corporate media. And so you wonder if there's a double standard at play here. So the next question is, uh, what are your thoughts about reparations? Well, I support the uh, HR 40 and Senate Bill 1083 for a commission to study Af uh, reparations for African Americans. <clears throat> I think uh, that is warranted because we've had 400 years of slavery, Jim Crow, and discrimination going right down to the corporate crimes that stole uh, disproportionately Black people's homes uh, after the Great Recession. Black America lost its half its wealth. It was during the Obama administration, but it was these corporate criminals like uh, Steve Mnuchin, who's now the Treasury Secretary, and Wilbur Ross, who's now the Commerce Secretary. Uh, Mnuchin was uh, head of One West, which was uh, uh, did a lot of uh, predatory lending and foreclosures targeted at Black and Latino and Asian people, and uh, was involved in the robo-signing scandal, which Wilbur Ross was right at the center of. He owned mortgage servicing companies, and that was just computerized theft without proper documentation of people's homes. And a lot of them were black people. So what I'm saying is the dispossession of black people, uh, you know, another example, you know, post uh, slavery and post Jim Crow was the discrimination by the US Department of Agriculture against black farmers, which was documented in court and they're supposed to get reparations, which took a long time to, uh, you know, help them get more land and it still hasn't been fully implemented. So uh, that's with respect to, African Americans. Now, they're not the only community in our country that uh, deserves some form of, of repair or reparations for what has been done to them. Uh, we have 370 treaties with uh, indigenous peoples, and uh, we have violated a lot of them in terms of the services we agreed to provide, in terms of the land that was stolen. Uh, there's a treaty that affects Mexican Americans, the Treaty of uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo, which settled the uh, Mexican War in 1848. And that's a land's right question in New Mexico. So I think uh, those are issues that, uh, and communities that need uh, attention as well. Uh, so we can bring our society together on an equal basis. So, you know, reparations is about making people whole and repairing damage. And uh, I think another way we need to do reparations is this drug war, you know, particularly targeted poor communities of color. And we need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission where these communities can talk about what happened to, their, to them and what they need to be made whole. And uh, also the people that, you know, perpetuated or perpetrated the harm on them would have an opportunity to, uh, you know, come clean and, and talk about, you know, what was wrong about that. Because, you know, as we saw in New York City with the, uh, um, what was it? I'm forgetting the phrase, but, you know, they... They called them getting thrown, the people that were thrown, black and Latino, mostly young men, uh, stop and frisk. And uh, they called it getting tossed. And, uh, you know, it was millions of them just because they were young and black or brown. And uh, and then they would uh, usually didn't find in you know, 90 percent. They found nothing. Most of the charges they did find was possession of marijuana. And they ended up in the criminal justice system. Um, I think some of the police officers that were involved in that probably regret that. And we had an opportunity for them to testify as well. So I think a Truth and Reconciliation Commission dealing with the war on drugs would also be appropriate under the broad rubric of reparations. So 
I'm getting to where that's the end of questions. We've been going for about 40 minutes. And I appreciate you listening. And uh, there's only five of literally hundreds of questions that came in. So I expect we'll be doing this again soon and answering more of your questions. And thank you for listening. Um, if you want to get involved in the campaign, go to the website, howiehawkins.us. Please sign up so we can stay in touch with you. Uh, there's a place to volunteer. There's a place to donate. And there's lots more information on the, our stances on the issues there. So that's it for now. And have a good evening.